Hi, my name is Tracy Tebahama Espinosa. I'm speaking to you from Quito, Ecuador. Uh, it's a pleasure to welcome you to part two of the week seven lecture on language um, in the Psychology Course 16 on um, online mind, brain, health, and education here at Harvard. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to look at the second half by um, dividing it into four big parts. First, we're going to talk about the benefits of bilingualism or the benefits of multilingualism. Then we're going to play a game about the myths of multilingualism to see exactly where the evidence is as far as good things, bad things uh, related to foreign language acquisition. And we're going to talk, along the way, we're going to talk about um, state of the research in these different fields and then hopefully generate a lot of good um, discussion that we'll be able to post on the boards uh, this week. Um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, this is one of my favorite topics. Um, I've written a couple books on this, and I'm very, very, um, very uh, pro uh, foreign language. I know that um, that really um, adds a slant to the way that I'm looking at these things, but I hope that it's beneficial um, uh, in trying to convince some people who have been naysayers about integration of foreign language into um, early school settings. I hope we can have a, a really good debate about that um, in this week's um, work. Um, my main reason for actually doing this and for loving it is because I've raised three children in um, four languages, and um, they're great. For the past uh, 20 years, uh, my daughter Natalie and my son Gabriel and my other son uh, Mateo uh, have been doing just great with languages. Um, my daughter graduated from the German Abitur and, and had to take language tests at the exit and, and was shown to be um, a perfectly balanced multilingual, speaking, reading, writing, um, all comprehension levels uh, in uh, English, Spanish, and German, uh, though her writing in French isn't um, all that terrific. But um, she doesn't have an accent in any of her languages, neither do the boys. And I think this has a lot to do with the early um, acquisition that they had. Um, I myself speak Spanish fluently. I have some German, some French, some Japanese. Uh, I love languages, and I am um, a big proponent of this, so I hope um, I can um, convince all of you that this is a good thing to do, in, independent of how old you might be right now or how old your children are. Um, to begin, I'd like to just sort of share with you some of the benefits of bilingualism, and we have a very important, serious video here to share with you. Okay, on a more serious note. We do know that there are overall general cognitive benefits, uh, social benefits, economic benefits, personal benefits, communication benefits, cultural benefits, and global uh, academic benefits to learning a foreign language uh, or to having multiple languages in your life. Um, these, uh, they're, this is a new thing. Um, when I was growing up in California in, in the 60s and 70s, it was still thought of as, you know, oh, you're bilingual? Oh, sorry. <laughs> but now we know that there's just generally good things that happen when you have several languages going on in your brain. We also know that uh, bilingual children have higher levels of abstraction at, abstraction at earlier ages, uh, that they're able to inhibit languages, um, they manage language rules faster, um, and they actually are using more of their brain. It, before, we used to think in the 60s that you know, you had a little pie for language and, you know, it's horrible if you were to be bilingual because you'd cut your potential in half for any language. And we just know that that's not true anymore. People who are um, raised bilingual from birth actually have a slightly larger, um, Broca's area is slightly larger in the posterior area and basically using a part of the brain that would not have been used by a monolingual if you're brought up. If you have languages introduced later on, you're actually using other areas of the brain that just wouldn't have been used for anything else. So it's not like you can take away from brain space um, if you are learning languages. So I um, hope that that's, uh, that's uh, something that you guys uh, can uh, will accept because especially um, people growing up in my, uh, my time, it's just a recent thing, only in the past uh, 20 years or so, and really only in the past 12 or so, has there been a strong advocacy for teaching foreign languages earlier in our schools? Uh, we have just come to the conclusion that there are no disadvantages in, in, uh, in being bilingual. Uh, we know that the uh, bilinguals um, actually are helped a lot of ways um, cognitively and actually even um, 
can stave off some of the negative effects that a child might have in a monolingual environment at home uh, in a poorer uh, setting. Uh, to show this, I'd like to share a really quick uh, one and a half minute video about this. Hang on. Benefits that uh, Laura Ann Petito was mentioning there, and that um, the person to her right is uh, Ellen Bialstock, who actually has done a lot of research in this area. Um, those benefits have been uh, replicated in lots of different places. For example, I work very closely with some schools in, um, in Holland, in Rotterdam, in, in poor areas, and they found that by introducing um, English as a, um, an additional language um, for two to three year old kids, when tested a year later, not only did they have higher English scores, but actually the Dutch scores went up. So there's basically a, a generally higher level of metacognitive awareness um, and kids are better at language just because they have additional languages in their lives. Um, anyway, so great benefits there. There's also, it's also been shown, this is the story that um, Lauren was mentioning there, that children who exper uh, experience early extensive and systematic exposure to their languages you know, gasp the, ga grasp the concepts of their languages. And if you look at their brains, they're basically, um, it's like having two first languages. We know that you're having two first languages in this setting. And so basically there's nothing uh, negative about it. As we mentioned that there is a slightly greater growth of um, um, Broca's area, but almost nothing else. The whole entire processing looks identical. Um, let's look at a, a, another um, another short video uh, about four minutes long that has uh, additional benefits mentioned. So we can go on and on and talk about all the great benefits of multilingualism or bilingualism. There are several other uh, videos that I mentioned here. If you'd like to take a look, uh, we don't have enough time to do this within this video, but I do encourage you to try to have a look at these if you are still in doubt about uh, the benefits of having multiple languages in your life. Um, we're going to turn now to this uh, game about myths, but we're going to frame this within the context of factors. Um, all ten of these factors influence successful bilingualism or multilingualism, even in their absence. Now, the true and false um, quiz that we're going to have right afterwards, sort of, uh, it's trying to, uh, we'll try to explain each of these different factors um, in a more enjoyable way, but just as a quick overview. Uh, we know that when a person learns their foreign languages, uh, it, it does influence their success rate, but mainly in the area, as the, as the, um, the woman mentioned in the previous video, in accents, uh, and that's it. In all other areas, in comprehension, vocabulary, semantic understanding, um, writing skills, in all other areas, there is really no difference. Um, so we know that there is going to be difference for if you care about your accent, yes, but otherwise um, there is no um, maximum age uh, within which somebody can learn a foreign language. Aptitude, we know that aptitude exists. It's about 10% uh, of the population has a high aptitude for foreign languages. If you've got it, great, take advantage of it. If you don't have it, it's not the end of the world, but um, it is an important factor. There are motivational influences, we know, both uh, intrinsic, extrinsic motivators, positive, negative motivators, we'll have a look at more in detail. We know that the pair of strategy and being consistent with that strategy has a huge impact on successful um, bilingualism or multilingualism within the home as well as within schools, and we'll talk about the different strategies that exist. Um, there are none that are superior. To one another, but there are some strategies that are that are easier to be consistent with, and we'll talk about those. Uh, we also know the factor of opportunity and support, um, the uses, whether or not languages are uh, considered a benefit within the context in which they're learned, um, is also important. The last three factors, siblings, uh, gender, and hand use, had less um, backing behind them when I proposed this as a theory in 2000, and now there's a great deal of evidence that does show that they're is an influence. There are influences that are positive as well as negative in, in having a brother or sister when one is learning another language. Uh, boys and girls, there's no such thing as one being superior to another related to language um, acquisition, but there are some things to be said about the way that boys and girls go about learning languages. And we also know that hand use is a very good indicator as a reflection of cerebral dominance for languages, um, and that does have some impact related to literacy skills. And there's another factor that um, I'm not going to list here that um, many people talk about, but um, it's not included here because it does uh, change. 
uh, and that is personality. You know, extroverted personalities do tend to learn faster. However, personalities, uh, an, individual, an individual doesn't always have the same type of personality in all settings. So it's not listed here because it is, it's a changing uh, factor. Okay, so keep these things in mind while we look at this, um, this true and false quiz and just come up with some answers here. Decide if the, if the statement is true or false and why you think it's so. Okay, start with the first one. True or false, by learning more than one language, a child can suffer brain overload. Now, obviously that is false, right? Um, we know that if a child is brought up bilingual from birth, basically he's learning languages as if there were two first languages and the same mechanisms, the same systems, the same pathways are used in the brain for the first as well as second. And if, if a child has a third language, they're all in the same um, physical structure and the pathways are very, very similar. Um, the reason that this comes up is um, in, in California, you can be brain overload. We know that, right? The idea is basically it's just too much for your brain to handle. We know that that's just not true, um, but we do know on a psychological level, so maybe it's not your brain that's overloaded, but your mind that can be overloaded. We do see some kids who get stressed out about doing this. They feel, you know, their head's about to explode. They feel like it's too much. Um, we know that this can be something on a psychological level, but it's not on a physiological level. Um, Berlitz learned five languages simultaneously from birth. We know of a study where somebody's learning 11 from birth. Um, learning two or three is very common around the world, so we know that that's not something that would cause brain overload because we know that the brain actually adjusts and actually uses different parts at different ages. So um, it's not a physiological thing, your brain can handle it. Your brain can handle several languages at a time. Number two, true or false? Some languages are easier to learn than others. What happens if I change the question a teeny bit and I say some languages are easier to learn than others for a newborn? If I say it in that context, um, it's pretty clear. Human beings are born universal receivers of all language sounds. So anybody from, uh, from any part of the world, born anywhere, any human being can speak any language because in order to be able to pronounce a language, you have to be able to hear it, right? So if you're born a universal receiver of all language phonemes, you're able to produce all the, those different sounds. Um, let's say you think that Mandarin is a hard language. Chinese is so hard, it's so hard, and let's say that English is so easy. If you have a newborn in a crib, you know, looking up at mom, you know, speaking Mandarin and dad speaking English, it's not like the baby's going to say, you know, forget it, mom, I'm not going to do this. I'm only going to go with the easy English language. That, that'll that never happen. And it won't happen. Uh, if it were to have happened, it would have, it's, you know, think of evolution. It's kind of like a linguistic Darwinism thing. All the hard languages would have faded out by now. And they haven't. They haven't because no child finds any language more difficult than any other um, when, from birth, right? But we do begin to pass judgment um, on our languages. And when we know, I guess there's two stages where this could also be true, right? Um, when we know enough about our first language, we start to compare and judge new languages. For example, I, spoke, I speak English from, you know, it's my native language. When I began to learn Spanish, I, I thought it was quite hard because in Spanish, you know, all the articles, you know, uh, have sex attached to them, you know, it's, it's masculine or feminine, and I spent a lot of time trying to understand you know, la taza, la mesa, I had to try to understand what the gender was of different articles. And I got over it, and I learned Spanish, and I'm fine at Spanish now, but then I tried to learn German. And so, from German, first thing that happened is German changed, like, the sex on, like, half the things that I thought I knew. So, like, La Luna, the, the moon, ended up being masculine in German, where it was feminine in Spanish, and that threw me off a little bit. And then things that were like, you know, there was illogical things for me, like, like little girls, you know, I have no reason, no understanding why, up to today, why girls, little girls, das Mädchen, why girls are neutral in German, it makes no sense to me. So, at that point, I decide, German is harder than English. You know, I'm making this comparison again. So we know that people begin to judge languages and say, well, this is harder than that, based on uh, comparative aspects. But we know that little kids don't do that. Um, kids just pick up and run with it. They don't have a judgment call. They don't judge whether this is a good or bad or hard or easy 
uh, language until they're a bit older. And so it takes a lot, uh, lot longer for them to actually begin to make those comparisons and actually say something is uh, more difficult. A second reason this might be true, well, many of you might have said it's true, has to do with um, writing systems. Um, we automatically believe that if, the, if a language, a new language we're learning, shares the, the phonemic alphabet, for example, A, B, C, D, then it's easier. And that we presume that things like Arabic or Russian or Chinese or Japanese or Korean, those are more difficult because the writing system is different. And so we will begin to make those judgment calls. Um, but in general, uh, no language is harder than any other uh, for a child. So we should, you know, take, bear that in mind. And as the, the woman mentioned in the other video, the earlier the better, okay? Number three, bilinguals are more creative than monolinguals. There's very little research in this area. Um, however, the little research that there is, uh, Ricaldelli, uh, for example, identified uh, 33 different types of creativity, um, problem solving, art, music, whatever. And she found that bilinguals were, they had higher scores on 30 out of 33 of those tests. Now, nobody knows why. It could be something about the brain, or it could just be perhaps the lifestyle, um, the culturally openness of, of bilinguals. Nobody really knows. But, um, but it does tend to be something that's quite positive um, for for uh, bilinguals, it's an added benefit. <laughs> uh, true or false, bilingualism can cause problems such as stuttering and dyslexia. We know this is absolutely false, okay? Um, dyslexia, you're born with it, you know? It's not something that, you know, is caused by having several languages, although we do know that um, it can be aggravated. It's hard to learn to read in, if you have dyslexia, and it's doubly hard if you're having to do this in an, an additional language. So we know that it doesn't cause it, um, but it can irritate it. There's no reason that a dyslexic can't become um, multilingual in an oral level. Nothing impedes that. However, the writing skills are, are, um, are a big challenge there. Stuttering in general, most uh, cases of stuttering are psychological, they're not neurological. Yes, there are neurological um, roots to, to some stuttering, but most stuttering is based on psychological um, causes, and it is not, um, it is not caused uh, by bilingualism. Uh, if a little kid comes up to you and they say, you know, I, I wanna, I wanna, I wanna, I wanna, they're not stuttering, right? They're just looking for a word that they can't find. And, you know, there's a way out of that. Just give them the word. You know, if you just give them that vocabulary word, you will stop that. So basically, we know that that's a, it's not a cause, you know, but typically speaking, you know, when that kid is doing that little uh, song and dance, if I want to, I want to, then your mother in law passes by and says, look what you're doing to that kid. And we know it's not true. Bilingualism, it's uh, blamed for a lot of things, and rarely is it really the true cause of problems. Um, definitely not of stuttering. Um, number five, it's impossible for an adult to learn a foreign language as fast as a kid. This is totally false. We know from research in the UK that adults are actually better at learning foreign languages if and when they spend the same amount of time as a kid. Uh, we find that kids, you know, are they're fully immersed in the language. They're using it all the time. They're with their peers. Uh, they spend five, six, seven, eight hours a day in the language or more. Whereas adults, you know, they'll maybe take a foreign language class, you know, for a couple hours a week, and then they wonder, you know, oh gosh, my kid is such a sponge, they're learning so fast, and I'm so slow. It's just not true. Um, because adults have the crutch of having uh, already an established language, they can actually use language rules to their advantage. They know what verbs are and adverbs are, and they understand irregular verbs, and they understand sentence structure, and they understand that all sentences need, you know, subjects, verbs, and objects. So they're actually able to use that to their benefit. So adults are faster than kids. Sorry. Um, however, you should say, ah, but what about, what about foreign accents? It's impossible for an adult to learn a new language without an accent. Um, first of all, never trust a question that says impossible or never, or something like that. Um, Adults can learn foreign languages uh, without accents. Um, however, there's many reasons why many adults don't. 
Um, some of those reasons include just the simple fact that uh, a lot of people believe that learning foreign languages to help them communicate. And so, you know, so I have a little accent, you know, but you understand me, so we're communicating, so the accent is the least of the worries. That could be one thing. Um, a second reason is because your, your tongue is a muscle, and you have to be able to hear something to be able to pronounce it, but then you also have to force your mouth into doing things that maybe it's not been used to doing. However, just like, you know, maybe today you're not ready to go out and run a marathon, but if you train, you could. It's the same thing with your tongue. If you really want to train, you, you can get around that. Um, a lot of people say, oh, I can't uh, speak Spanish because I can't do that, you know, thing. Well, you have to practice, and if you practice, you can get over that. You can actually speak without a foreign accent. And in fact, there's a fellow, uh, Alfred Tomatis in France, you know, he guarantees he can teach anybody to speak any language without uh, an accent, uh, and any adult. Um, but the deal is he basically bombards the brain with phonemes that um, the brain is not connected with. So, like in Japanese, you have ra and la, and that's the same symbol. Um, so Japanese grew up hearing ra and la as being the same because they don't distinguish that. But if he wants, if Tomatis wants to teach a Japanese person to speak without a foreign language, he basically bombards them with ra, la, ra, la, ra, la, and then he makes them, okay, you say it, ra, la, ra, la, no, okay, bombarding your head with this. And basically, um, he says he can do it. Um, people pay him thousands of dollars to do this, um, but then again, other people say, yeah, but I'm communicating, so, you know, what's the big deal if I have a, a bit of an accent? Another reason adults have accents is um, due to their first language or first languages. Different languages have different numbers of phonemes, different numbers of sounds in them. So, for example, if you speak Swedish or Dutch as a first language, you have a really broad range of phonemes, which means that the likelihood that you can speak, say, uh, English, which has slightly smaller number of phonemes, um, or Spanish with even less phonemes, the likelihood that you will speak those languages without an accent is pretty high. But if you speak, for example, a Spanish speaker going to English has a higher probability of having an accent because they have fewer sounds than English does. And, and you know, poor thing, you know, the Japanese, there's no sounds. It's a i we o, kakiku ke go, there's very few phonemes, which means that the Japanese will speak with an accent in almost any other language um, that, they will, that, they, that they come across. However, um, there are Japanese who don't have accents. So that goes to one of the factors we spoke about, which is having a high ha aptitude for foreign language as well. So there's lots of reasons why people can, can have accents. Um, the final one, which I think is pretty, pretty important, um, has to do more with um, cultural identity. Uh, my husband speaks five foreign languages and all with this, you know, sexy Latin accent and it's great, you know, but, but it's also a cultural marker. It says, hi, I'm Ecuadorian and I'm speaking Japanese and, or I'm speaking French and it shows people without him having to declare anything that he's from somewhere else. So a lot of people just like their accents. So um, anyway, so we have to sort of decide out of the whole range of things that happen within language you know, reading, writing, speaking, understanding, vocabulary things, of all the range of things, the only thing um, that gets put at risk with the older you get uh, is your accent. So if accent is the only thing that's hanging us up about learning languages when we're older, I think we have to get over it because there's very, um, there's a lot of reasons why we're going to have an accent. And um, they're not necessarily bad reasons, you know, so we have to think about whether or not that's important and that should be an impediment for us um, actually attempting languages. Seven, when a child learns his languages from birth, he's effectively learning them as two first languages. That's just to see if you were paying attention at the beginning. Uh, the answer is definitely yes, right? We know that the whole mechanism, it's all working identical uh, for a monolingual or a bilingual child um, brought, uh, brought up from birth um, with several languages or with two or three languages at a time. Um, but how do those languages look? Depending on your age, and there's at least three big hypotheses out there, right? Um, one is that, uh, like in this first box here, that you have a kind of a firewall in between your languages and they don't ever overlap. And you might suspect that would be true with languages that don't share um, a syntactic structure, that don't share um, 
uh, any type of, uh, of vocabulary and that don't share um, symbol systems or alphabets or anything like that. So um, probably, um, I guess if we could say, maybe Arabic and Korean or something like that. They're so distinct that maybe there is such a way as to divide them. But the second idea is that you actually have languages, like you'll have a strong first language and then you might learn a second language, but not as good, for example. And that's kind of um, one on top of another. And in other cases, um, probably the most um, popular, and this is um, Whitaker's work, is basically this overlap hypothesis. Most uh, several languages that, that we know or that a lot of our kids will be learning in school, for example, Spanish, French, German, they do have uh, overlap with certain things with English, for example. And so you will be sharing either you know, some vocabulary, parts of speech, or um, the, the grammatical structure of the language. So we're not really sure how languages actually um, coincide, but one idea is that they that there could be all, any of these could be true, depending on the age and the type of languages that you're learning. We know that um, people brought up, from, so bilingual from birth are basically going to have the same structure, and that basically this cuts off really early, around seven months or so of age, um, you know the brain or the skull, sorry, the skull grows so fast in the first three years of life, that basically um, giving a uh, you bring the space to actually locate things in other areas at will. So we know that, uh, as we mentioned before, babies are born universal receivers of language, but this will quickly narrow. This was Worker and Tease did some um, studies on this, where they showed that babies six to eight months old, eight to ten months old, and ten to twelve months old were kind of, they were all wired up. These were Anglophone babies who had English at home. And they were exposed to sounds in um, Czech, Hindu, Sulu, and Spanish, which have uh, phonemes, they have sounds that don't exist in English. And they found that all of the six to eight month old babies had separate firings for each sound. So basically, the brain as a universal receiver of sounds was taking them all in and creating connections for each of those individual sounds. But when they tested them again from eight to 10 months, only about half of the sounds um, were fired for. And by the time the kids were 10 to 12 months old, they only had um, firings for the sounds, for the phonemes that actually also existed in English. So we know that um, this, this narrows really quickly. So if you want children um, to be exposed to language, to be able to speak them without accents later on in life, if they decide to choose to learn them, Early exposure is always positive. Um, I was told by a, a student in a, in a workshop recently that they heard of these experiments, that in Singapore babies are exposed to sounds um, in very diverse languages. Um, they're encouraged, the mothers are encouraged to um, play uh, nursery rhyme songs in, in a huge variety of languages to expose them to language sounds. Nobody knows if that's going to work, okay? But we do know it can't hurt, okay? so. They're kind of taking a chance here <clears throat> and recommending that, you know, that parents actually expose their, their newborns in the first year of life to, to several different language sounds so that eventually if they're going to learn languages later on, they can actually learn them without accents. Um, we also know that, you know, you're using more of your brain. Basically, um, bilinguals are using more, you know, space in the brain. But again, it's not anything that would have been used by anything else. Like, it's not encroaching on any other language skill. It's not like you're worse in math because you have languages. Nothing like that is occurring. Um, and we also know that humans have this unique ability to learn languages, which is much more uh, a functional thing. It's much more by, by the pathways. It's much more of a connection of areas than it is by structure. Uh, there's not, uh, your brain doesn't look terribly different. It look, there are more connections. But um, there's not like there's this, you know, this extra growth anywhere there in the brain. It's not a structural thing. It's more functional. True or false? All people have the same area of their brains to speak different languages. We know that this is definitely false. Um, we know that typically speaking, um, as we said before, 95% of right-handed people and 70% of left-handed people do have Broca and Wernicke's area in the left frontal and parietal lobes. However, you know, there's this 5-10% of right-handed people that don't and 30% of left-handed people that don't. And we also know that people who are learning languages at a later time are also, you know, putting languages, there's a far greater right hemisphere use um, for additional languages as well. So we know that this is false. 
Um, here's a strangely worded question. It is not recommended that children learn literacy skills in two languages. So basically, children shouldn't learn to read and write in two different languages at once, true or false. This is not necessarily true. Um, this is, can be false. However, it's not ideal. We know that in the best structures, for example, in the Euro European school model in Brussels, they have a system where um, children come in at three years old and they start school in their native language. And then two years later, they um, are introduced to what is a world language, um, which is basically a, a, a European Union language, which is also a UN language. Uh, in a form of play. So they, by the time, so when they're three, they have their native language. When they're five, they begin free literacy skills in their first language, and they're introduced to the second language through play, okay, which is a world language. Two years later, seven years, they have strong literacy skills, two years in their first language. They begin free literacy skills in the world language, and then they're encouraged to learn a third language. They're introduced to a third language, which is supposed to be a border country language. So if, um, let's say you live in Spain, you should learn either Portuguese or, or French because uh, you border with those countries. So that's introduced in either a, um, it can be physical education, it can be art, it can be even math, which is very demonstrative. Um, but also the main goal here is that they love the language. The main goal is to make them fall in love with, with this language. So there's a huge affective element there. So in their second language, they're learning pre-literacy skills. And in the first language, they're solidifying their, their language skills. At nine, the fourth language is introduced, again, through demonstrative classes. Pre-literacy starts in the third language. Now they have two, two years of solid literacy skills in their second language. And they're working on their four, you know, four years of, of literacy skills in their in their first language. This structure basically guarantees that the fourth language still has seven years to improve upon literacy skills, which is um, fabulous because we know to gain oral language skills you need about one to two years, but to gain literacy skills you need um, between five and seven years, this is Cummings' work, um, to be able to have um, age appropriate native level skills. So we basically see that by the time these guys graduate, they will graduate in four uh, languages at the level for entering university, and um, they have extremely high level language skills. Now what do they do that's so good? They have separated three factors, right? They separate time, place, and person. So going back to this question, if in a school you have a school structure that divides by time, place, and person, but it's the same year, but the time is division by morning versus night, place is just one classroom versus another classroom, and person that you have two different teachers, it can still work. It's not ideal, but it can still work. I have worked with school districts, um, I'm sorry, school systems in 24 different countries, and they do this. Um, some of them do this uh, better than others, but the best systems separate by a longer period of time, definitely by different people and physically in different spaces. When they do that, they are successful. Um, how do you get to multiliteracy skills? There's really basically five different steps and we're, we're all saying basically the same thing. Initially, the kid has to just understand, you know, what is the point of the written word? And you'll find, you know, little three-year-olds and they'll come over and they'll say, uh, what do you want to eat? And they'll play restaurant or whatever. And they realize that they're pretending, they're not writing anything, but they're pretending to write something down because they grasp the concept that we write, we take notes to remember. Our brain is fragile, it can't remember too many different things. So they understand what is the purpose of written language. It's basically to be a record of something, right? So when they can get that, then they can be introduced to um, the phonemic alphabet, which is basically one sound to each symbol. So a, b, k, d. So you're matching just one sound to each of the different symbols. Once they've got that down, then you know you move on to the step of actually saying, well, there's exceptions. Do you know that the the E that's the uh sometimes is E like in me. So it can be like elbow, like uh, or it can be like egg, or it can be like me. So that same symbol can have several different um, sounds connected to that. 
Once they get over that, then they make this leap to this other idea that in languages, the same symbol can also have exceptions. Um, so in French, it's uh instead of e or uh. So they, they start to understand that you can actually keep the same letters and you know in different contexts, they will have different sounds attached to them. After they've got that, it's basically practice, it's familiarity, re repetition, and the frequency with which they are exposed to the, to the words that will allow them to be able to read and write in another language. Um, in my own kid's case, because the German school system was teaching them to read and write at around age uh, five or six, five and a half, six, uh, I took advantage of this natural curiosity that they have, that kids tend to have for language uh, around three, four years old to, um, to teach them pre-literacy skills in English before they did that in Spanish and then two years, uh, sorry, in uh, German, and then two years later they did that in French. And then um, at one point my daughter, she's around nine, she said, you know, mom, it's a shame I never learned to read in Spanish. I said, oh, great, you know, why is it a shame? And she goes, oh, no, it'd be, I'd love to read in Spanish, but I never had a class. And so, you know, taking advantage of her own interest, um, we began teaching her reading and writing in Spanish. And then we moved back into a Spanish um, context where she really had to solidify her skills. But basically, we separated her exposure to each of the languages by several years, each with about two years separation. And it's worked out fine. She writes um, like a native in all of in the three languages, not in French, but in uh, English and Spanish and in German. Um, just reiterating this, we know that basic oral skills take about one to two years um, to achieve. However, literacy skills, depending on the system, uh, take about five to seven years. Um, something really, really interesting about English is that when we speak, it's basically Anglo-Saxon, but when we're writing, it's really um, Greco-Latin. So actually, it's very kind of, it's that's kind of the, the clash that a lot of um, non-native English speakers have uh, when they come down to writing in English. Uh, writing in English is not um, intuitive, and we can blame the Dutch for that. Um, the first printing press um, that was taken to uh, England uh, they decided the first thing that they wanted to print, the very first document to be printed, was going to be a dictionary. And the people who brought over the printing press, um, the Dutch, helped write the dictionary. So when the, and actually, uh, English was pretty phonetic, actually, up until that first printing press there around the 1500s. They actually, you know, they said yacht, Y-O-T. And the Dutch said, oh, that's just ridiculous. You know, that should be Y-A-C-H-T. And, and there was a change, not due to what had, you know, previously been the, the real, you know, the, the way of spelling English, but basically that was changed because of the, the help that we received from, from our friends, the Dutch. <laughs> okay, true or false. The general research finding examining trilingual brains to date point to no pattern for multilingualism. Remember we talked about there's... A general way your brain looks when you're monolingual in learning languages, there are some patterns for bilingualism, um, depending on the age that you're learning them. Um, is there a pattern for multilinguals? No. That's kind of wild, isn't it? Um, these are studies in the University of Basel which were trying to document brain scans of people from different uh, language backgrounds. And they found that, you know, the fellow from Turkey who went and learned Swiss German and then learned English when he was in college didn't have a brain that looked anything like, you know, the kid from India who went to the French-speaking part of Switzerland and then learned English. Their, their brains were occupying different, uh, different parts. So, no, there's no real pattern. This has a lot to do with individual experiences. True or false, multilinguals are shown to be faster at working memory tasks than monolinguals. Totally true. And this is actually fabulous. This is one of the reasons there's so many cognitive benefits. Um, so much of learning depends on working memory capacity. And apparently, multilinguals, bilinguals, they have an expanded working memory capacity, basically because they're always you know, holding several things in their head at once. Basically, um, we know that working memory is different from short term, right? Short term is like memorizing certain units, memorizing like a five, or sorry, seven different um, units, like a telephone number or something. Whereas working memory has to do with processes. So, you know, being able to look at a math formula, go back to your table and write it down and, and you know, 
practice that. Having extended working memory is beneficial in all areas of study, not, uh, not just languages. So we know that that's probably one of the reasons that there's so many cognitive benefits of being bilingual or multilingual. True or false, bilingual students achieve higher results on English language proficiency tests than their anglophone and monolingual peers. Totally true. Um, and actually, in a, in a flip of this, there's something called the Schwachdiplom that the, that the German students take to actually show their level of understanding. And my daughter, who has English and Spanish at home, had the, the top Schwachdiplom score. And the German students said, well, that's impossible. She's not native. And that's exactly why she had a better score, I believe. Um, we know that when you're learning, when you learn your own language, you rarely um, delve into the, into the grammar of things. But when you learn a foreign language, you actually do learn things like parts of speech and you explicitly taught certain things about syntax and, 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 and construction and grammar rules. Um, therefore, if uh, an English person were to take a TOEFL test, they wouldn't do as good as a foreigner taking a TOEFL test because basically we haven't learned those rules of grammar um, uh, explicitly like a foreign language learner would. Um, we know that they achieve higher scores, um, and but these scores are kind of, you can't generalize them too much. There's no difference on um, reading ability, but all on, on other things like um, Grammar, there's definitely uh, a distinction. People who are foreigners do better on English language tests than, than uh, English native speakers do. 13, a nine-year-old has the same size brain as an adult. Therefore, they learn foreign languages in the same way. The first part is true, the second part is false. Um, a nine-year-old does. You know, their skull is basically, your head is about the same, the same size. A nine-year-old and an adult have a basically the same size head. And the mechanisms, actually, for foreign language are actually pretty much the same. But there's a big difference uh, socially about what's going on here. So um, Judith Ruteros just got this concept of basically people are motivated to do things based on their peer groups. So a nine-year-old kid who's dying to play with a kid next door with a soccer ball is going to use his language, right? And his 14-year-old sister who, you know, hates mom, hates dad, hates everybody, is probably going to find a group of people who also doesn't want to learn the language and because of her social group, she'll have a different dynamics. And then the mom, who's taken foreign language class, you know, will not learn anything. So basically, we know that um, the mechanisms for learning are different. But in this sense, it's not because of your brain. It's more for social reasons that these things are different. The brain mechanisms are, ident are identical, but, not, um, but the motivational factors are very different for age groups. 14, the more languages you know, the easier it is uh, to learn an additional one. Totally true. Um, research by McLaughlin and Knight showed that um, they had a room full of people who are monolinguals, bilinguals, and multilinguals, right? They were college students. They left them in a room with a bunch of scraps of paper, which had something, was a, it was Monrovian grammar. It was a dead language. And they left them on the tables, and they found that the monolinguals basically you know, made paper airplanes. They basically didn't do anything with the paper. The bilinguals you know, had a good look at it, figured some things out. But all of the multilinguals figured out the grammar. They started looking at it and said, well, yeah, hmm, these must be verbs because you know, they look the same, but they change in their stems. And oh, there's a bunch of these. These must be the articles. And uh, they must precede what must be nouns. They generalized everything that they knew about language and they had deciphered the grammar of the language without even understanding. I mean, they couldn't understand it, but they used all of the rules that they had been used to. So we know that the more languages you know, the easier it gets to learn an additional one. Um, there is a bump from one to two. You know, it's a little bit harder, two to three. You know, we hit past four, and it's all a piece of cake. So, you know, go for it. <laughs> Fifteen, the quality of the first language impacts the quality of the second language. And the quality of the third language depends on the quality of the second language. True or false? Totally a trick question. Everything depends on the quality of the first language. Basically, it's it. And, and it can't be that you have several first languages, OK? But if you have gaps in your understanding of your first language, it's kind of like, you, it's like building a building. You have no foundation on which to build anything else. You can have beautiful walls and windows and roofs roofs, but it will crash because your foundation is not strong. So 
you do need to have a strong first language because it will impact how well you are able or how successful you are in learning a second or third language. Um, this is not to say that you have to learn one language and then learn another. You can learn them simultaneously. 16, most of the world is monolingual. Totally false. Let's do some math. If you know that there are like 2,500 to 6,000 languages in the world and there's like, what, like 200 something countries, do the math. Somebody is speaking more than one language. In fact, most of the world uh, speaks more than one language. Um, it's estimated that about um, uh, two-thirds um, uh, to, of the world is at least bilingual, okay? Um, in the top spoken languages in the world, we know that you know, Mandarin is the most spoken native language. Spanish is the second most spoken language. English is the third most uh, spoken native language. However, as a second language, more people in the world speak English um, than any other language in the world. And as I mentioned in the other video, this is going to last at least for another 40, 50 years, so keep it up with English. Um, several other myths that are here, um, you know, that people become schizophrenic if they have several different languages, or that true bilinguals never mix their languages, or um, that they have kind of, you know, old people can't, you know, ever become fully Bilingual. All of these are, are general myths, and I hope that we can sort of get rid of all of those. And if in the discussion group you have some myths that um, you'd like to throw out there, I'd really like to, to sort of you know, clear the room of those things, because there's a lot of great evidence out there now that sort of gets us away from thinking about that. Okay? Okay, we're going to watch a really quick three-minute video that sort of sums up these myths and also the benefits of um, bilingualism. Stretch this point even further, um, I'd like to share just a, another three-minute video about um, autistic children and uh, learning another language. If you recall in an earlier video, there was a mention that children with other types of language impairments or who have difficulties with language should not be kept from being um, uh, bilingual. This goes for cases of mental retardation, dyslexia, all the rest of it. There's no reason not to be bilingual, and this includes autism as well. Okay, to sum up then, we're going to actually go back to these 10 key factors and just look at a slide or two on each of these different uh, factors. And as we do this, I'd like to um, suggest that you yourself uh, think about your own personal situation or kids that you might work with uh, or your own children and actually try to figure out what might be their combination. The idea of this is basically, it's like, uh, it's like cooking. Um, you might have the ingredients of a, of a crepe or a cake or a pancake you'll find that it's basically all the same thing, right? It's flour, milk, egg, vanilla maybe, or whatever. It's all about the same, and these are the same ingredients here. But those three things don't taste the same, and basically nobody's going to have the same recipe um, as far as foreign language is concerned because they're going to have different combinations, different quantities of each of these different factors here. So um, hopefully you'll be able to take all of that into consideration and try to balance out what would be the factors um, that you might be able to uh, influence if there are, if they are factors that you can influence um, in the bilingual kids in your lives and in order to make their um, endeavors more successful, okay? We know that there are windows of opportunity, um, and these are not the critical periods, but these are moments where, for example, if a kid is exposed to languages in the first nine months, of life, the likelihood is that he will not have an accent in his languages. So we know the earlier the better. Um, it's a great time to learn another language and as kids are universal receivers of foreign languages, they won't, um, they will be treating them as two first languages, all right? We also know that there's something like a window and a half, which goes until around two and a half, three years old for people who have a high aptitude for foreign languages. Um, basically, the time greatest head growth, you know, between zero and three, around two and a half years old, um, the skull grows sufficiently enough where um, these three bones descend into the auditory canal, they're called ossicles, and they basically, you know, change slightly the way that sounds are perceived. So if um, a high aptitude kid is exposed to languages, let's say in the first three years of life, um, the probability that he can go back and retrace uh, those connections in the future and speak that language without an accent is quite high. Uh, we know there's a second window of opportunity which is huge, more or less around the age of uh, four to eight, when little kids learn languages. 
basically because little kids have little egos and they don't have a problem with making mistakes. Um, this is a big difference for kids more or less around eight, nine years old. They start to care what everybody else thinks of them. If you have, let's say we have a, a five-year-old named um, Timmy and we have a his dad, uh, John, okay? John brings home a new game for Timmy and he puts it on the floor and he says, okay, let's, let's play this. And, um, you know, Timmy will start to take out the pieces and start to play. And, and what does John the dad do? We adults, like, read the rules first. We want to know all the instructions. We want to know the right way to do things before we even start. And Timmy, you know, just sort of takes the pieces and starts to play. He'll just put it all together. Uh, he'll put together what he's got. Um, John will correct him and say, no, no, it's not this way, it's the other way. And he'll just adapt the rule. And he doesn't have an ego problem. He has any problem with being corrected. He will just let himself be corrected. Um, and that'll go on pretty much until, you know, around eight-ish, uh, nine-ish, um, when we start to care. We start to care too much about what other people think of us, um, if they're going to make fun of our accents or whatever, and we start to give up. So when we say that, you know, oh, kids are such sponges and they learn so fast when they're kids, uh, as opposed to being older, um, there's not a lot of truth to that, but there is a lot of psychology to it. Um, I guess maybe some of you, and some of you are probably that kind of an adult, you can keep that open attitude your whole life long. Um, it really depends on how you were brought up, I think. And if you're just open and willing to make mistakes, because that's what learning is, then you're probably going to learn faster. But we have to accept that um, there's a great window there in the early years, and we should try, uh, especially in the States, we have a very poor policy of foreign language, uh, foreign languages. I mean, Europe is so far ahead of us as far as um, understanding that early introduction is, um, is the most powerful. Uh, we should really learn uh, from those lessons and actually try to adopt earlier language uh, learning. We would avoid having, you know, embarrassed teenagers who hate, you know, the whole idea of foreign language and reject everything if we would stop doing this in high school and we would start doing this in the early years. Um, there's also some early uh, language milestones to keep in mind. Um, it is totally normal for a kid brought up bilingual from birth to mix his languages. Um, totally normal. There's no reason that a kid should know that these are separate language systems. The way to speed that up is that if you're consistently, you know, whoever's supposed to speak one language or in whatever context, uh, that they're consistent with that strategy. That's key. Um, but around three years old, kids start to label their languages and they'll start to say, well, mommy says it like this and my teacher says it like that, or mom says it like this and dad says it like that. And then they'll actually give them names, like um, mom will speak in Spanish and dad's speaking in English or whatever. So they'll start to, to label their languages. And around five or so, kids are very cognizant of this concept of translation. Like you'll say, you know, oh, um, you know, grandma's on the phone or abuelita's on the phone. And they will do what, you know, everybody else does from that point on. They basically are cognizant of having to switch their languages and speak in the proper language to the proper person. Um, there's also this other stage. It's called uh, syntactic conservationism, which is really... Um, it's scary to some parents because they don't expect it to occur, but it is also totally natural. It's related, again, to this law of minimal effort. Kids will choose one of the grammars of one of their languages and apply the grammar to all their languages. Um, my son Gabriel did this. He just decided he would use English grammar with everything, with Spanish, with German. He didn't, you know, he applied English grammar to all of his languages. The difficulty with this is, is that, um, we rarely correct, adults around those kids rarely correct for that because we understand. And we understand what they're saying, even though the grammar's incorrect, we, we get the message, right? And so we don't usually correct the kid, and that's wrong. Uh, if we can be aware of that and help model back for the kid um, when they say something wrong or, or the, the house uh, my house uh, red is, or whatever, instead of, and you say, no, oh, your house is red, you know, switch it around for them, give them the right model, but don't let them get away with it. Even though you understand it, uh, the only way to speed up getting through that is having good models, all right? And we should also be really clear that, you know, these milestones, you know, they can go like uh, around 12 months in either direction, you know, earlier or later, so um, people are pretty individual in doing this, so these are good uh, maybe good points of reference, but they're not true for all people, okay? We know that the second factor relates to aptitude. You're born with it, you know, 
The population has it. You can measure it. There's a modern foreign language aptitude test. Um, partner accepts it's kind of a sub level of language as far as an intelligence is concerned. Malavine, same thing in the neural developmental constructs of language. Foreign language is a sub element there. But not all people have it, and we shouldn't count on it. Um, but you should take advantage of it if, if a kid does have a high aptitude to really you know, continue to add on languages. There are kids who love sounds, they experiment, they love languages in general, um, they're curious, you know, give it to them. If they want it, give it to them. The third factor has to do with motivation, and we know there's these two powerful partners, you know, the, the positive and negative as well as the intrinsic and extrinsic motivators. And we know that people can learn in all, all of these quadrants, right? Uh, you can learn negatively, extrinsically, but our goal as parents, teachers, should really try to be to help kids figure out why they should want the language for themselves. Or to find, you know, you have to be a good strategist. I mean, how can I find something the kid already likes and then do the language through what he already likes? For example, um, my kids were not reading for pleasure in German, my, my two boys. They, um, they would read a lot in English, but they didn't pick up German books for pleasure. Um, but they loved um, the Guinness Book of World Records. So uh, one day I came home with the Guinness Book of World Records. I said, hey, look what I've got, guys. And they got all excited. They said, ah, oh, but it's only in German. They were like, oh, no, it's okay, it's okay, whatever, whatever. They just wanted the Guinness Book of World Records. They didn't care if it was going to be, they didn't care what language it was in, right? So basically, if you can find something that kids already like and then use language as the vehicle, that's much more powerful than, you know, shoving them into a class. Um, one of the strongest motivators in the world is, you know, love. I mean, how many of you have learned a foreign language because you fell in love? I did. I mean, basically, um, that's a very, very powerful motivator. Um, unfortunately, the opposite is also true. We have kids who know that they must pass, you know, whatever class, English class, in order to pass the year, and they don't because they hate the teacher. So if, you know, the, the feeling, the emotion that's attached to this is really, really powerful in influencing whether or not there's going to be success or not in foreign languages. Um, we know that four and five strategy and consistency are incredibly important. Um, there are about seven strategies that have been really um, studied in depth. None is better than the other, but you must be consistent with them. And they are divided by uh, person, place, or time. You can basically divide your strategies up by that. Um, one person, one language is a person-based strategy, right? Place. Uh, this classroom is always going to be in Spanish, and that classroom is always in English. That's a place strategy. Uh, time can be that, you know, story time is always going to be in whatever language. But choosing a strategy is very, very important. Um, and being consistent is fundamental. And you have to choose a strategy that's developmentally appropriate. You can't choose a strategy, for example, um, based on time, and a kid wouldn't understand the time concept. For example, I had a, a woman tell me in, in, in Switzerland, she says, well, I speak, you know, five European languages, and I want my children to speak them as well. And I said, well, that's cool, you know, what's your strategy? And she said, well, on Monday I speak English, and on Tuesday I speak French, and on Wednesday I speak Spanish. And I was like, you know, okay. I said, how old are your kids? And they were two and a half and three and a half years old. And that just doesn't work because a two and a half year old doesn't even know before and after. I mean, they don't get it. They won't understand that there's a, even a strategy in place. So you have to be very careful to choose a strategy that's very, um, that's very open to the kids, that kids are very uh, aware of. Otherwise, it won't work. Um, we know that support um, and opportunity for use of language is very, very key. To use kids who only learn languages in a school context with no opportunity for use um, outside of that space will not flourish in the language. Um, the best way to create opportunities is to have friends. I mean, age appropriate lang language exchanges is, is, uh, is one of the best things you can possibly do. Um, and also, this goes for communities. Uh, in the United States, we have a terrible problem with still, you know, some communities still think, you know, English only, English first. Did you guys know that we are the only country that does not have, or one of the few countries, that does not have an official language? There's no official language in the United States of America. But we presume that English is kind of this um, 
it creates a social equalizing effect that we presume everybody's going to speak English. Uh, unfortunately, um, some people have taken that to mean that you should drop whatever other language you have at home. And that should not, you know, happen. I recall Obama mentioning to Richardson in, in, in one of the debates that he thought, you know, one of the best characteristics and what he admired about his, the other fellow's um, education is that he was brought up bilingual. One thing that we should do is encourage people to be brought up bilingually, but also immigrants, we shouldn't ask them to drop their language. We should be much more uh, open to that. Um, and it's going to be very important for the future of the United States, economic future of the United States. So hopefully we're creating not only opportunities, but also that we have a community that's highly supportive of that. If you travel throughout Europe, the everything, the trains, the signs, the orange juice carton is multilingual. It, there's a support for language throughout the community, which we don't have yet in the United States. And I hope we can try to try to fortify that a bit. The seventh uh, element has to do with um, historic and, and linguistic relationships between languages, which we mentioned before. We talked about love language families that can exist, um, how you can sort of divide up the language families. They sort of grow up together. And basically, by isolation, they actually end up having um, different types of languages. So being separate actually helps develop even more, uh, more languages. Um, there's different ways of plotting these things. Um, but basically, we know that languages that are associated or related to other languages are easier to learn than, than others. We also know then there's like linguistic typologies and languages that share um, these linguistic bases that have the same order of the words should be easier to learn than those that are different. Um, for example, in um, German past tense, we all uh, it's hard for an English speaker to realize that the verb is always at the end, right? And that's something that's very hard to sort of um, think about because that's not the way we would do this in English speaking. So you have to, um, we find that languages that share the same structure are easier or faster to learn than those that have different structures or different typologies. Um, from here, we're going to look at uh, first and second languages have uh, powerful influence on third languages. Basically, um, based on the typology of the languages is very important. The speaker's proficiency in the other languages that they have, their metalinguistic awareness, if they understand general rules of language, um, and how much time is spent on the language itself. Um, the educational level of the student, but that's also directly related to vocabulary issues, right, and reading um, levels. The age when the languages are learned, as we mentioned before, parent involvement, as well as teacher uh, qualifications for language. So these are sort of the things that sort of spill over from first and second languages into third language. The factor has to do with siblings. Um, there's, there are positive and there are negative effects of having a sibling when one is learning another language. Um, positive is that you can increase the number of opportunities that there is for you. So um, if you're using um, a foreign language and kids are having the foreign language at school and they come home and they practice more, that's great. However, you can have negative influences as well when kids don't want to compete with their peers or when one peer dominates um, the other peer. So you sort of have to create the space for them to actually have equal opportunity uh, for use there, okay? We also know that um, boys and girls do um, Learn language is slightly different. It doesn't have to do with the brain thing. It has to do with the frequency of use. Nobody knows exactly why, but women speak more than men across the lifespan. They will use more words in their lifetime. Um, how does this impact language learning? We tend to look for signs that kids are getting it, right? We tend to give up on about three-year-old boys when we're raising kids bilingually. I know uh, hundreds of families I've worked with, there's a moment where of desperation. You know, it's hard, you know, this consistency thing. It's really hard raising our kids bilingually uh, or multilingually. And at least with the girls, you sort of get a hint that something's going on in there because there's a lot of use of language. Um, and with the boys, since they use far fewer words uh, in a day, we see far few, less evidence. And so we tend to think that nothing's going on in there, but that's just not true. Um, there's nothing that says that boys are better at languages than girls or vice versa, nothing that shows that at all. But um, it's an evidence-based thing. So we just have to sort of, you know, you know, hold our breath a little bit and, and give the, the boys a bit more time there. I remember my, my daughter, um, 
she's the oldest. I, I call this the boss syndrome, the bossy older sister syndrome. She basically is so helpful and generous in her personality that her younger brother, um, she was like the official translator. You know, she he would go, ah, and she, ah he's hungry. And he goes, oh, no, he's dirty. And, and he didn't have to speak, so he didn't speak, you know, law of minimal effort again. He um, basically let her uh, do the talking um, until he started going to school. And about three, three and a half or so, he was in the school, and I remember picking them up from, from, um, from school one day and asking, you know, basically, you know, how was your day? How's everything going? And, and my daughter starts in and blah, 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 you know, telling me all about her day. And all of a sudden, out of nowhere, Gabriel said, it's my turn. <laughs> and, and he hasn't stopped talking since. So basically, you know, there's this, uh, a, a way that we have to sort of um, gauge and measure and sort of give space to, um, to the kids in the family, um, especially, you know, the, the whole boy-girl thing. Of course, there's girls who don't talk at all, and there's boys who talk a lot. But in general, um, girls are using more words in a given day than a boy would. So there's a little bit more evidence there that they're actually getting it. But both are probably getting it, okay? The last factor has to do with hemispheric dominance for languages, which is a pretty good um, reflection of cerebral dominance. Somebody who is right-handed tends to have broken Wernicke's area in the left hemisphere. However, most left-handed people also have broken Wernicke's area in the left hemisphere. So um, that's to say, most of the world will have language um, in their left hemisphere. However, there is evidence that there are people who don't. Five to 10% of right-handed people, 30% of left-handed people don't. And that's a lot of people in the world. Since we devise um, school materials for the average, we find that there's a lot of people then who are also being left out of this average thing. There's some studies in the University of Washington showing that um, people who have hemispheric dominance for languages um, different from the average or typical brain actually um, prefer to learn literacy skills more like um, we might strategize for a, a dyslexic. Instead of by phonemes like a cat, we, they prefer to learn whole groups of words like cat, hat, mat, bat, rat as chunks of words um, together. We're not exactly sure why. We don't have enough evidence in this area yet, but we do, it's something to keep in mind. When you're thinking of these 10 factors that influence um, a successful language acquisition, if you do have, you know, a second born boy who's left-handed or whatever, you know, think about all the possible factors, the possible things that might be going on in that kid's life to either be positively or negatively uh, contributing to his language learning or her language learning. Finally, um, I'd ask you, you know, what is this missing factor? And I did mention before, um, personality uh, comes into play. Um, strong personalities, people who just will like, you know, I'm gonna learn it or die, you know, this attitude of they're just gonna go for it, they do learn faster than people who um, are, are more meek or shy with their languages. So um, personality is important, however, personalities are different. Um, and they change, and the same person can have different personalities in different uh, social contexts. So it's not included here because it fluctuates too quickly, but it is something to keep in mind. Okay, so here's the general summary. We talked about timing, the windows of opportunity, aptitude for foreign languages, motivation, the pair of strategy as well as consistency, opportunity and support uh, for foreign languages, uh, language typologies and similarities, um, the influence of siblings, gender, and hand use, as well as personality. Um, these are all um, strongly influencing factors in successful multilinguals or bilingualism, um, and I hope that this has been helpful in um, better understanding how to motivate or what we can actually influence in the children's lives that are um, within, within our um, realm of influence so that we can actually help more people become either bilingual or su successful multilinguals. Thank you.